Hey, welcome to the Gastroenteritis Blues. My name is Steve Lippman. I'm joined by Dan Volpone. Emily Cannell is right now shuffling herself on her way from bowling. Her arms are tired. Her legs are tired. She just has bowled a game. She is huffing and puffing her way uh, right from the alley. Um, she's on her way. Um, uh, we have sprung forward today. Dan is fatigued. We cannot wait a moment longer. So we're going to start this podcast and she's going to get in here and get her takes off as soon as possible. She should be here any minute. Um, Dan, I ask you, how was your day today? Did you remember to set the clocks forward or is this no longer something that matters because we have phones that do this automatically? My phone does it on its own, but also it's Sunday, so I didn't have to wake up at any time. I was actually pretty proud of myself. I woke up because I, I really don't sleep in well. And I could have used some sleep. So I was like, wow, I slept till nine. Like, that's great. It was only eight, which is still a pretty good night's sleep for me. That's like, mm-hmm. usually I can't sleep past like, you know, 745. But I really thought I made it all the way to nine. Didn't happen. Um, but my day was fine. Watched some basketball, finished a paper. Can't complain. Love it. How was um, your day, Steve? Hey, pal. My day was good. We took um, Rainy, uh, our dog, to a little indoor dog cafe called Chateau Le Wolf here in Astoria, New York. And uh, she played around with the dogs inside and she did great. <sighs> the Sixers. So this week they played the Chicago game. It must have been Monday of last week because it feels like a year ago. I don't think we can say anything about that game. Do you, do you have any comment on that Chicago game, which feels like so long ago? They I was won. at that we... game. Oh, um, okay. I was at that game. It was a lot of fun. Um, they got off to another bad start, but not as bad of a start as they've been getting off to. Like they were only down eight, which is actually like a pretty good start for them these days. Mm-hmm. Um, and Chicago, you know, they're pretenders, but they're a good team. So it was definitely a good win. They won by 15. Um, I really thought like most of the guys played pretty well. Um, and there were a lot of big dunks, uh, which was definitely, I think, the highlight of the game. Um, more, way more than usual. Um, just like... It's great. I liked it. It was a it was a nice game. Uh, then they didn't play again until Sunday, so it's crazy. They didn't play from Monday till Sunday, but uh, it's what happened. Um, Sixers beat Chicago, which means that they beat Chicago all four times they played them this year. So that I would feel totally fine about a Chicago playoff series. I don't. They must have played a fully healthy Chicago with Lonzo and Caruso at some point this year, but like, you know, that we obviously will have played him, played them without Harden. And, you know, I just have no problem playing Chicago. Um, Tobias in that uh, game played very good defense against DeMar, which probably tells you how, you know, DeMar's had a great year and I think it's a very cool story, but I don't, I'm not especially worried about like a, DeMar DeRozan's your best player team. Um, So, yeah, we have to talk about um, the Brooklyn game, which we had talked about for so long as, you know, sort of the game. And you went to that one too, right? No, I I could not afford to go to that one. You couldn't go to that one? No. I think Emily Emily, Emily went to that one. So we'll have to talk to her about that one if she gets here. And... You know, this was, we'll talk about the Ben stuff as a separate conversation, but what the fuck happened in that game? Because there was so much hype. The hype going into this game was insane. Well, that's what happened. <laughs> True. The crowd was frothing at the mouth. These people were insane. I mean, it sounded like a playoff game. Um, obviously, there's the Ben dynamic. So the, the fans were nuts. Um, you know, wanting wanting to go after Ben. And, and again, we're going to talk about Ben separately. But, you know, they just looked like shit from the first moment of the game. The only thing they were getting was free throws for Joel. I think they had either 10 or 12 free throw trips for Joel. And, and you know, he went nose to nose with Durant in the first quarter, which was like a, sort of a moment you know, where, where it seemed like somebody's alive they were already here. already down like 10. On the Sixers, too. they were. And they let up 43 in the first quarter. Like, Harden was so bad in this game. Just 
horrible. Hor- like he could not, it, it seemed like he was out of it. It seemed like he just like, I don't know if he was tired or if he was like, his hamstring was bothering him or something, but he just looked, I mean, he looked terrible. He looked, he had some threes. I think he shot like three of seven or something from three, but that was it. He, he I don't think he made a two point shot. Um, every, but everybody looked bad. I mean, Maxie, I think only took maybe six or seven shots. Um, they couldn't get anything to go. Um, Kyrie and Durant were excellent. Um, and they just looked terrible. They were down 20 at halftime and they come out of half and you're like, okay, can we fucking get it together? Can we make a little run here, a little spurt to get it to like 10? And the first two plays were like a hard and miss three and then a dribble handoff that like Bruce Brown steals and dunks. And you're like, all right, time to, time to pack it in. Um, in the first half, Embiid was killing Drummond, which was fun, like an embarrassing Drummond. And then that like ended, they went away from that. And it was just like, oh man, this big game we all talked about for so long as like the big showdown, they're just completely no showing. And like, my first question is why did that happen? And could that have not happened, please? And my second thing is like, are we worried in a larger sense about that game? Because I think there are two big, like two different questions. Like, why the fuck did that happen? And are they indicative of anything that we need to actually be worried about? What do you think? Um, well, for why it happened, a, lo- a lot of things have to go wrong to lose that badly. Um, but I think... Well, like a lot of things were bad enough where they could have lost just on those things. Um, they they were not ready for the atmosphere in a way that the Nets were, even though the Sixers were home. Um, the the Nets were on fire shooting the ball. Sixers defense didn't help with that. They put up basically no resistance. But you know, just because you play awful defense doesn't mean teams are going to make every shot. Even when you have Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving and Seth Curry, you still might not shoot that well. Um, they did. Sixers couldn't get anything going on offense. Um, I, 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 you know, Harden was was just horrible. Uh, they're not going to win games when he plays like that. Um, am I worried? Like, I don't know if you can watch the game and not be worried. Um, I'm not panicked. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's over for them. I don't think that they no because of. I don't think because of this that they they couldn't beat you know the Nets in a series that I'm convinced of that all of a sudden. But yeah, there were problems. They need to fix some things. Um, and of course, Ben didn't even play yet. Um, but well, that's that's a that's a hopeful thing for me. It's <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's the hopeful well, thing. It's like at least at some point Ben's gonna play. <laughs> yeah, but it was it was bad. It was bad. A lot of things went wrong. But like. You know, obviously Harden didn't play this game, but but in the Boston game, um, when they lost by, you know, 48, it's kind of a similar feeling. You know, it was like Boston made every shot. The Sixers missed every shot. On top of that, the Sixers played awful. Boston played great. Boston, even without Harden, isn't 48 points better than the Sixers. Um, I think the Sixers beat them all the other times they played this year. Um, sometimes you have an awful night. Um and when you have an awful night against a really good team having a great night, you're going to get killed, um, even when you're a really good team. And so, uh, you know, I'm worried a little bit, but like, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to think about it too much, put too much stock into it. I don't want to let it ruin, you know, the upcoming games uh, for the rest of the season, for the playoffs coming up. Um, I'm not ready to talk myself out of this team. So the Harding thing was – The thing that bothered me more than anything was because like him missing some shots is fine, basically. Like he takes some high degree of difficulty shots that are not going to go in every night because they're high degree of difficulty. Like that's fine. Like you're going to have nights where you shoot like shit. Like we're going to talk about the Orlando game. He didn't 
shoot really great from that from the field neither did joel 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 went like nine for 30 from the field like that's just gonna happen like star players are gonna miss a lot of shots what bothered me was that the offense looked so different from every other game in terms of the movement and in terms of him operating it's as a pick him. and roll guy like he wasn't finding like they weren't running the same stuff like with him and maxi and joel like it just looked so weird in the way that it just seemed like nothing was happening in the way that we had grown accustomed to it in those first five games. So that was more concerning to me than anything. And that's the same way that it happened in the first five games, the same way that it can happen again. So that's honestly, for me, like why I don't, I'm not worried about it in like a super macro sense, but like, that's why it was so frustrating for me watching it because I was like, wait, why isn't fucking nothing happening? in a positive way like because him missing shots like and him overly grifting which was honestly really annoying for me like him just sort of like running into people and like flailing his arms at the ref was getting annoying because like at a certain point you're not getting the calls and like you need to go to your floater you need to like go to a jumper and like you know do different stuff um but that that was what was really bothersome to me. Maxi's defense was terrible in this game. Like Maxi was biting on every pump fake. And I generally am really optimistic about his defense. Um, I think he's a good defender, but Seth Curry was getting him in the air constantly. And, um, you know, Kyrie was getting fouled by him. Like I, they just couldn't rely on him. Um, and then there was the Doc decision, which I don't even know if you disagree with, but he had Tobias on Durant and Matisse on Kyrie to start. What did you think of that? I mean, I'm basically fine with Matisse on Kyrie. Um, Matisse is not, is, Matisse can't guard Kyrie, just like he couldn't guard Trey Young. Kyrie is tougher to guard, um, I think, than Trey Young is. Um, but he's at least not at a physical disadvantage. Like Kyrie's going to score, but he makes some sense on him. Kevin Durant, as, as great as Matisse is blocking jump shots and, and, and he fouls on that a lot too. Um, and he has long arms, but Kevin Durant's longer. Kevin Durant is really good at shooting over guys. Um, I'm not sure how much Matisse would bother him. He would probably get Matisse like, up even more than Kyrie did because Matisse really has to jump to block a, a Kevin Durant shot. Um, and really, uh, you know, Matisse, Matisse struggled. Matisse let everyone get by him. And he, he sometimes does that too much where he tries to play defense from behind, which he's very good at, but against such good players, you can't do that. Um, I, I, I don't know because they don't have, like, I wouldn't put Matisse on Durant, but I also, I, ideally, you know, you have Matisse in a role where he can help off of like Bruce Brown and constantly be like coming to double Durant and like constantly be coming to try to just like be a second guy to annoy his shot or like get in his way. Um, But then like, what do you do with Irving? So I, I, I didn't really mind Tobias on Durant um, because they don't really have, no one in the league is, is really going to match up perfect with Durant, but it would have been nice to see, like as great as Irving is, and you know he was coming off a fifty-point game, like, and I know Danny Green didn't play, and Danny Green can't guard him, but like, maybe stick someone like that over there, and 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 like just have Matisse in a position where like whichever of Durant or Irving has the ball, he can just be ready to come run at them, and defense is ready to rotate. I don't know it. I don't know enough basketball to try to guard that team though, but I, I would have liked to see them send more pressure at Durant in general. Ladies and gentlemen, and Emily Cannell. Emily, how did you bowl? I bowled really well, actually. I beat my Let's average go. all three games. I almost had three strikes in a row and I was ready to do the Tobias like three on the eye. This one, I was Perfect. already, yeah. And then I didn't get a third one, so I didn't do it, but I was ready for it. Proud of you. You were at the Brooklyn game. Um, Indeed. How did you like it? Was it good? I mean, I liked the first like quarter and a half. 
I would say, even though they... Were you rooting for Brooklyn? (laughs) No, but (laughs) there was an intensity in the first quarter and a half that I really enjoy. I really thought there might be a fight, which I like. I enjoy enjoy fighting. Mm -hmm. I enjoy technical fouls. I enjoy um, people talking trash to each other namely Kevin Durant and Joel Embiid, Mm -hmm. all of which were present in the first quarter. And I really enjoyed all of that. And then once the game like truly, truly got away from them, all the intensity really died down and then it just kind of got miserable. Um, But the first quarter and a half I felt was very fun. Are you concerned uh, given the huge letdown that, that all the hype, you know, led into this game and then uh, they just sort of laid a big giant egg. Uh, are you concerned with uh, that kind of performance? Um, yes and no. I'm not concerned that they lost that game because I don't think that there's really any team in the league that would have beaten Brooklyn that night with the way that they were shooting. Like, mm-hmm. literally, I don't know that Kevin Durant even hit the rim until like maybe – the third quarter um but it it's more can so not necessarily like the game as a whole but more like the not showing up in a big game situation kind of similarly to the celtics game like the celtics are huge rivalry and they just kind of shit the bed in that one too um like big like nationally televised and then they're just like losing by like over 30 points in both of those games i know that was like a pre james harden game but I think that that is slightly concerning, but not not that exact game, but this like type of game where they continue to not really show up at the level that they need to is a little bit concerning for me. I think that it's hard because I think if they can get up for tomorrow's game, I think that would be a big like show for them. But on a back to back where they played in overtime, I'm not sure that that will happen, but I think it would go a long way to kind of like call the narrative that they don't play in big games. Can we, uh, can we talk about tomorrow's game for a second? Because I have tickets to tomorrow's game. I bought them back in like September. See you um, there, buddy. I will see you there. Um, I'm sure we'll meet up at some point. Um, at the ice cream. Yeah, for sure. At the milkshakes. Um, I, uh, I think Harden probably rests tomorrow, which I'm fine with. He's been looking just like slow. I don't know if, you know, something's bothering him, you know, in his leg. Um, But I think it kind of makes sense to give him the day off. Um, He hasn't really looked himself. He's missing short a lot. Um, He's not, he's not getting out on the break. Like he, not as bad, but he looked to me like on a couple, a couple plays where he was like leading the break, kind of like, uh, last summer in, in the Brooklyn Bucks series where he just like could not run the break and it's like because he had the hamstring and he doesn't look quite right. Um, I would maybe give him a day. Embiid has to play. Like I cannot defend Joel Embiid once again taking a rest day when they play against the Nuggets, when they play against Nicole Jokic. Like I, you know, I, I believe Joel Embiid is the best is the best center in the NBA. Um, There's only one other guy who, who you could say it is that guy just won MVP and over Joel. um, A lot of people, probably more than half of people would call him the better center. Um, And Joel needs to play these games and he needs to play this game. You know, it, it, I understand they're on a back-to-back. Well, then you plan for that. And if he has to take off, he should have taken off tonight because he cannot cannot take off tomorrow. I could not defend him not playing against Jokic again. And I'm not trying to sound like our guy Keith and in, in, insinuate that he is dodging certain players. Um, but at the very least, that would be him not making the right moves he needs to make to be able to play that game against Nikola Jokic and he has to play against Nikola Jokic. He has to play head to head against Nikola Jokic because if the two times they met this year, Jokic played and Embiid was out with rest, that he, would. Was that true the other time? Uh, he missed the other game. It might I might not have been rest, COVID. but he's, no, no, he's, rested, he, he's yeah. rested against, he's rested against the Nuggets in the past. 
Um, he, he has taken rest games against the Nuggets. And it cannot happen. And I, I can't defend it. And people are going to you know, say that that's a knock against his MVP case. And I'll agree if he doesn't play. He has to play. Okay. I, this is a bit out of order because we still have to talk about Ben Simmons. But I have to agree here. This is usually not something I would care about. But we're getting down to it here. And we're going to talk later about the MVP narrative stuff. Joel, you have to play in this game. No, I, I'm not worried about this. I think that there's absolutely no chance that he's not going to play in this game. Because and even if, first of all, it wouldn't make any sense from a organizational standpoint that they would play him in a six o'clock Orlando game in Orlando and not play him in an ESPN home game. It just doesn't make any sense that they would do this. So, so just scheduling wise. And also, I think the player, especially Joel, gets so much say in what games he does and doesn't play that I, I, I'm really not worried that he's not going to play. Now, of course, they play a fucking 100 minutes because they go to sleep for a full half tonight against Orlando. We haven't even talked about that game yet. But, buddy, you have to play in this game. You have to play. I think that he wants to play in this game. Me too. Me too. I do too. too. I do too. But I'm saying like, Doc, this is not the game to rest. We have an MVP trophy to win. We've got lots of narratives to win. Emily has $200, which means it's like $80 each for us. Like, listen. It's the the one game you can't rest. The one game. One game. Can't can't rest it. This is gastro at Sixers money that Joel Embiid is messing with right now. So. Yeah. So. Emily, you concur, right? Yes, he has to play. He's going yeah. to play. I'm not. I don't play. think he's like you said. If he was going to rest one of these games, they would have yeah. fucking rested him tonight. I mean, this well, might, the, the worry Joel's is going to talk to the media has, probably. Doc has talked doing about this. this. Doc has talked about the hard. Doc doesn't know what's have, going on. We well, know, of that. course not. But he says that they're going to have rest built in the rest of the year. Um, yes, yeah, and this, is, today. this is this is a back to back. Hey, I agree. I, I don't think he's going to rest, but I'm saying if tomorrow is we're wrong and for some reason we can't understand the game against the Nuggets is a rest game, that will be indefensible. It just it just will be, and it, it would be a rightful knock against his MVP case. We can't have that. Yeah, I agree. I, will... I have money on him too. I have less than you. I didn't get him as. I didn't get him at the odds you got him at. I should have plus listened to Plus 4,000, baby. I got him plus 800, but that's still good money. I still want to win that. Here's, here's the pivot. If he does this, the pivot is that he doesn't even think Jokic is in the running. So, well, he would so, be wrong, so he <laughs> no, needs to no, play. I, I understand. But, but I'm saying our, larger... our pivot is that he thinks it's him against LeBron and Giannis. So he's LeBron. Not <laughs> The Lakers are the Lakers are the nine seed right now, so I'm not sure LeBron. Yeah, I'm just but. getting us ready for the Anthony pivot. Davis and Giannis. Yeah. But <laughs> the uh, no, the I just think that the like even outside of the MVP race, which like obviously you know I'd like to win my money. Like there's a larger discussion about who's the best center in the league. Um, like I don't think that you know who wins MVP this year. Although if Jokic wins back to back, that's a pretty good case for him. Um, but like I don't think. <laughs> I don't think, you know, Jokic winning last year or if Joel wins this year, that doesn't, like, seal the deal. That, like, then they both just won MVP, like, and came in second, the other one. So it's like, you know, that doesn't seal that one of them's better than the other. Um, and, and realistically, they're very different and both very good. And they're probably really, really close. Um, of yeah. course, I'm going to support Joel. But the, the idea that this is a matchup that is not, like, a must play that this isn't circled way ahead of time would be that would be a knock on on the MVP case on on his case to be the best center in the league the best player in the league whatever this has to be a game you've been looking at for weeks and saying you tell the organization beginning of the year I I can't rest the Nuggets game right yeah well and they plan all this out so just if you need a rest on the back to back you rest it against Wendell Carter Jr. You know all right so Ben Simmons back to the Brooklyn thing he came back to town. Ahead of this, Kyle Newbeck at the Philly Voice said that, so Ben was not traveling on this road trip. 
and then Steve Nash and everybody says he's actually going to come to Philadelphia. And uh, me and Emily on a recent podcast were like, that's fucking weird. Why would they have him just show up in Philadelphia so that everybody can throw tomatoes at it? Why, why would they do this? <laughs> so Kyle Newbeck says part of this is that he's building a grievance in order to try to get his 20 million back. And part of, part of the steps in this is that he wants to show up at the game for people to be mean to him and boo him to build this case. Now, I don't really understand how being booed is like, your honor, look at these boos. Can I have my money now? I don't really get it. So in the days leading up to this, George Niang, who I'm head over heels in love with, uh, when on the radio, he said that uh, he's going to add Ben Simmons to his list of people to talk shit to. Unfortunately, the Sixers didn't score any points in that game, so he couldn't talk shit to anyone. Wait, can we, real quick, um, remember beginning of this year, you guys were adamant that Furkan was more handsome than George Niang. I just, um, just want to say that, you know, I was, I've always been a George Niang guy, you know? Yeah, but I don't, I love him, but I, if I were to, make love to one of them i i still oh am not sure Jeez. well Dan, you had george fourth that is an that's aggressively high, high number yeah, that's too high. i know and i was right because now he's the fourth best six all right so i'm trying also, to think if we had anyone wildly low i'm looking at it right now so kyle asked george niang if there's a level of dislike for ben simmons in the locker room um and george niang gave such a great answer he said, I'm going to try to answer this the best way I can. It is what it is. We have who we have in this locker room, but I think we're happy with who we have in this locker room. I'm just going to leave it at that. Then he didn't leave it at that. <clears throat> it is what it is. He knows what he did or what he had to do to get himself right, whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent. That's not my place to speak on. Obviously, I have my thoughts about Ben, but if he's happy where he's at, then let him be happy. We're happy with the guys we have in this locker room and what want to be here. He fucking hates Ben Simmons. It's great. great. Um, what else? Uh, oh, Danny Green, who talks as if he's not an active player in the NBA. I love it so that, much. It's so funny. You just can't shut Ben up. Simmons changed his phone number without telling anybody and then didn't respond to any phone calls or texts because God knows who has that phone number now. And... Uh, Talk to everyone for the first time when he showed up to training camp. Now, remember, Ben was also upset that people didn't try to woo him to come back on the team. Great. Um, so then Ben came out before the game, which he isn't doing at all. Like, he doesn't do this before Brooklyn games. He came out before the game to, like, pass the ball to Patty Mills. Like, he's just egging everyone on. It's very obvious. The crowd was chanting, shoot the ball at him and he dunked the ball underneath the rim like with a shit-eating grin on his face as if it was the Atlanta series um but then there basically weren't many opportunities to boo him because the Sixers uh, got their fucking asses handed to him the whole time um there were videos of Ben trying to like get a coffee and people <laughs> screaming at him which was kind of funny um and uh yeah so what did you think of the you know he was wearing some ridiculous hockey jersey Louis Vuitton hockey jersey looks so looking stupid. as stupid as possible um you know all the commentary around it I thought was terrible and um it it just seemed clear to me that he was trying to this was set up to try to make the fans look as bad as possible. Um, nothing horrible seemed to have happened, you know? Like, a fan got kicked out towards the end, which didn't seem like anything horrific. Hopefully, uh, I'm not wrong in that, you know? I feel like we would have heard by now if something terrible happened. Um, but, you know, Emily what did the Ben experience seem like for you? I mean, it's hard to, KD said, like, it's hard to chant at Ben Simmons when you're losing by that much. And it's like, that's right. Like, what can you really do at that point? Like, if it was a close game or if the Sixers were killing them, I'm sure it would have been a great time. But, you know, what can you do? So what was the Ben thing like? Yeah, there were just a lot of 
Black Ben Simmons chants, which they turned the music up in the arena and all the sound up in the arena to try and drown it out, probably for the broadcast. Um, because I don't know if it was clear on the broadcast, but my dad at one point texted me like, what are they chanting? And I was like, it's probably better that you don't know. It was clear um, on the broadcast. Okay, well, that's just <laughs> my, my dad is almost 60, so, you know. Um, but the worst, it was just like, it was kind of weird because at the end of the game, there was that point where like the ball rolled past the baseline and Ben was there and Ben picked it up. And it was just like the perfect opportunity to every, for everyone to boo him for even touching the ball. And you couldn't help yourself, even though we were down by 30. Like it was like, he was just like giving us this on a platter, but also like for his own selfish reasons, like, look, I just touched a ball and they're still booing me. Um, I don't know. It was just like annoying for him to be there. It was annoying for him to like stand up and cheer for these people that are on his team that he's still not even playing for. Um, and it was just, it all seemed very performative, which I think it was. And that made it more annoying for him to be there. Like, I was like, get out of here. Like, no one wants you here. Like, honestly, like, I don't think that Sixers fans like wanted him there to boo him. Like, do the Nets even care? He doesn't even play. Like, who cares? Please leave. Thank you. Well, and like, it, it's not like they got it over with. Like, he, he didn't play. Like, when he plays, it's going to be awful. Yeah, like, it's going to happen again. And and so much worse. Like, yes. you know, it's going to, and also every subsequent time after that for a while. So, you know, I, I don't really, I think the grievance thing, I don't even understand how that would work, but. It doesn't make exactly. sense. Like, oh, I'm an opposing member of a team and they booed me. Like, no shit. It doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. He's not getting that money back. No. I, you know, the, the, that would just be such an awful precedent for the league. Not that I even really care the money. It's not like the Sixers are going to get that salary cap money, but like, it's just not going to happen. Dan, what do you think of the Ben, you know, experience? Yeah. I mean, the game was awful. Would have been more fun if the Sixers won. Um, but, you know, he just seems to be worried about like anything but basketball right now, like the grievance and the, you know, showing up to egg the fans on or like, you know, is he coming? Is he not coming? I don't know. All of that stuff. Like if I were a Nets fan, I'd be annoyed. Um, you know, the, he still hasn't played and doesn't really seem to be in a rush to play. Um, is not, is not vocalizing that he's in any hurry to come back. Um, but you know, it seems that, that that kind of thing is fine with the Nets team, which I guess is all that matters because really like it's, it's, it's more just the normal there to, to be okay with, you know, not playing basketball, uh, and not really wanting to play basketball. I mean, Kyrie's been doing it all year and they're all like pro COVID now in support of him. So yeah, I just, I, I don't, I don't think that it's something that I need to worry too much about because he's just not my problem anymore. But again, like I would have a hard time rooting for this kind of nonsense. And I did for a while. So for a long time. Well, um, the last Nets thing that I guess we can touch on briefly is that um, there's new conversation around the Kyrie thing. Because um, vaccination mandates in New York, where I live, are going away, except for uh, employees uh, in lots of places. Now, lots of people got fired during the thick of the pandemic um, for not getting the vaccine. Um, and Kyrie is still unable to play um, in Brooklyn and in uh, at MSG because he's not getting the vaccine. No, he also can't he, go to Canada for Raptors games. I know that's a side. Thing. Right. So he's also, um, he's allowed to go as a spectator, but he's not allowed to work there, essentially, as a player. Now, Nets fans are up in arms about this, and so are Nets players. Uh, so Kevin Durant today said, like, Eric Adams, the New York mayor, needs to figure this shit out and needs to, like, get on it. And, like, 
I guess I really hope that if we were in this situation, we wouldn't be like this because this is like so terribly missing the point of all of this, which is that like this rule was in place. And I understand that it looks silly when he's allowed to sit there, but he's not allowed to stand up and shoot the ball. Like I understand like that there is some backwardsness to that, mm -hmm. but the whole point, and, and also somebody pointed out on Twitter that like the, the, presidential aspect of this is that so many people got fired because they were working and they refused the vaccine and they were no longer allowed to work and then to just make this exception because he's famous and good at basketball would be awful and like it would be a slap in the face to those people so it just misses the point and it also like they put this in place so that more people would get vaccinated and that less people would die and like, I understand the pandemic's in a much better place now and that like they ease this restriction because like things are a lot better, but like this has been in Kyrie's hands the whole time. Like he could play so soon if he just got the vaccine and like he's making a decision every single day to not play for the Nets at home in the playoffs and, and for the rest of the season. Like if they have a problem with someone, it should be with Kyrie and like, I just think it's kind of gross and like shitty of them to pretend that like the mayor of the city needs to make this special dispensation for their favorite basketball player so that their team can win the trophy. Like it, it's silly, like lots of workers in the city do not have this right and he should not get it because he's good at basketball. It's like, it doesn't work that way. And, um, Again, I, I, I certainly hope that if, if we were in this situation, we would not be acting that way and, and asking for that sort of thing. I get that fandom makes people act in a silly way, but uh, I think it, it's kind of gross. So, uh, Dan, I know that you've been saying some similar things. Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I, I want to say is, like, something if, if something seems silly to you, if something seems... Like it doesn't make sense. It's possible that it doesn't make sense, right? It might just be something that's that's silly. It also might be that you just don't understand what this thing is that you are talking about. And a lot of people do not know what they're talking about. And I understand that this is, you know, not necessarily super straightforward. And this is something that affects everyone. So they feel that they you know, have the right to speak on it, which they do, but it doesn't make them right. And just because they find it to be contradictory and to be illogical doesn't mean that they're right. It could actually mean that they are just so uneducated on the topic and so blinded by basketball fandom that they are incapable of understanding what they're talking about. Now, if you understand what they're talking about and you're still against it, that is your opinion. That is at least a more educated opinion. But if you think that the point of the vaccine mandate and you, it, it is to prevent the spread of COVID in like one acute situation, which is like a basketball stadium, then you don't understand what you're talking about because it's not the purpose of the mandate, right? And like you live in New York, you know this, you know this very well and you alluded to it earlier, but like the, the purpose of the mandate isn't so that like Kyrie isn't like, you know, spreading COVID in the Barclays Center. It's so that everyone in the city of New York as a whole, as like a public health measure has to get the vaccine and feels pressure to get the vaccine because they need it to work. That is the purpose of the mandate. And generally it has worked very well. And this is not based on like someone's guess as to what it should be. This is based on like public health research that shows that this is the best way to make people get the vaccine. This wasn't like someone made it up. It wasn't like, oh, you know, we can let Kyrie go to the stadium, but we can't let him play. It's not about that specific situation. So if you're pointing fingers and saying, you know, look how contradictory they're being. Like, if you think that this law is about having Kyrie not give COVID to the guy next to him in, in the stadium, then I understand why it would seem that way. But that's my point of how, like, you don't know what you're talking about. 
And if you're arguing that like you don't need this law anymore, that's a different story. But the purpose of the law is bigger than Kyrie and is bigger than one stadium or one situation. It, it, it's, to, it's to convince people to get this vaccine. And so if you can't grasp that, then honestly, you need to shut your mouth. Because it, like I'm not saying you don't have the right to speak. You obviously do. But like if you're someone who cares about COVID and 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 you know believes in the science and this pandemic, then what you're doing is not understanding the public health research that went into this decision and just creating more confusion and calling calling something contradictory that is not necessarily contradictory just because it looks kind of silly to you. And I know these laws aren't elsewhere. And so you could debate whether you feel like they need them or whatever. But this is what New York's public health officials decided what was the best thing to do. And so either you support that or you don't. Like either, either, either you either you support those kinds of measures or you don't. But just because he's allowed to like be there, it doesn't address the purpose of this law. It's just like it just shows a misunderstanding which is fine if you don't understand, then ask questions, look it up. Like stop, like LeBron has done it. A bunch of Nets fans have done it. Just like pretending that this is something else. When, like we said, it is a public health measure to get people to get the vaccine. And it's pretty clear that's what it is, but I understand that that is not a super straightforward thing. Look it up, ask somebody. Emily, anything else uh, on this here issue? Um. Not particularly. Um, I think it's pretty clear that everyone on this podcast is very pro-vaccine. And I understand that it does look kind of weird that like Harry can go watch Duke play at Madison Square Garden and he can't play in games there. But like, I agree with Dan, like that's not the like entire point. That's not why the mandate's there to say like you can do. It's what Dan said, basically. Um, I agree with him. So that's all I have. Yeah. All right. We're going to go take an ad and then we're going to run through some uh, odds and ends from around the National National Basketball Association. I just I love this league. Great. We'll be right back. We're back. Um, Andrew Bogut, um, just a classic newsbreaker, had a uh, rumor this week on a podcast. I'm not sure if it was his own. I don't know if he's entered our, our space here. I'm not sure. He's not in um, our space. We're no, cooler. we're cooler. He's, weird he's got some weird opinions. Yeah. I think <laughs> <laughs> he's got some. He's got some weird takes. Um, but uh, he said that he's been hearing that Bradley Beal wants to team up with James Harden and Joel Embiid. Oh, we also <laughs> we didn't even talk about the Orlando game. I'm sorry. The Orlando game was a fucking weird one. Uh, so. Sixers. They did not deserve to win, but we'll take it. They didn't deserve to win. Uh, Joel and Harden both shot poorly from the field. They barely won. They played 100 minutes, I'm sure. Um, Bias anyway. looked good. I'm just surprised. Bias looked really Bias good. Did play well. Hit a huge shot. Which and he they, was like just catch and shooting threes. He was just doing it, and it looked great. They need I'll take keep it. doing that. They needed every bit of it, mm-hmm. truly. Big game. Anyway, um, Bogut sources told him that. Um, Bradley Beal this summer wants to come to Philly to play with Harden and Embiid and that it would likely be a sign and trade. Um, what do we think? Does Bogut hear anything? We've heard for like 20 years in a row that Bradley Beal wants out and then he never leaves. I get a real loser vibe from Bradley Beal. Um, I don't know, but um, sure. I mean, obviously I would go ahead and grab Bradley Beal, but um, you know, I've never known Andrew Bogut to steer us wrong when it comes to, uh, you know, news. One time sixer, so he might have his hand in the on the pulse of the organization. <laughs> Did he play he a game? Still... Like one game? He didn't play play zero that. games. I remember I think he, he was played... like, eh, Drew, I might have seen. I'm not let's... positive. I'm telling you, there's no way. But I'll, Drew, I'm going to basketball. Drew's, right. Drew's yeah, going to look this up. No, Dan, you take this. Take a few minutes off because this is what Drew's on. <laughs> Drew's, look, Drew's looking. Our stats department is on this right now. <laughs> Drew's already busy doing all the real work in the podcast. He doesn't have to do That's it true. A second. No, he, he never played as a sixer. Okay. Never played. All right, Drew. 
Oh, yeah, he never played as a sixer. I was going to say that. I was totally on it. Um, Second confirmation. Totally on it. I think, is Bradley Beal unvaccinated still? I don't no, know. He, no, he, he tried not. to be. He tried he to be, and Washington be. strong-armed him into it. So. Okay, all right. Just wanted to... He doesn't have that. a backbone like Kyrie does, apparently. <laughs> no. No, Washington Washington mandated it, and then... Um, Bill was like you, motherfuckers. And you see, this is this is the purpose of the vaccine mandate. Mm-hmm. Just Bradley so Beale clear, was like, I like money more than because it works. My big principles. So, so anyway, yeah. So he's. But when your principles too. are that stupid, you should. I said them. they were fake principles. Hey, no, I'm not disagreeing. I'm <laughs> not, not saying that you're. I'm not saying you're pro. You're pro. Okay, I'm just checking. I get thrown out of the bus for takes for beliefs that I don't hold on this podcast. <laughs> no, Emily, I would never put those words in your mouth. Like no, you were vaccinated before the we one did, time so. i did that we cut it out though <laughs> um emily okay um, that was really funny and i think we should have left it <laughs> it was a great moment that find the patreon never know. and you can hear it again it's cut um, it's dead it's forever <laughs> it's in the garbage mm-hmm. uh emily bradley beal what do you think is it happening no great dan what do you think <laughs> is it happening no i really don't think it's happening but i'm also like I, I just can't stand like the, the discourse of like the well do the Sixers even need Bradley Beal like you know who's gonna who's gonna guard who's gonna play defense against guards like come on man is Bradley Beal who's gonna guard him like, I don't know no he I doubt he'll be a Sixer until like, Danny Green says it I'm not buying it and he'll be the his, first one to break the news or Danny Green's little but, buddy what what's his name Harrison Sanford yeah why do I know that but I would I would take Bradley Beal on the Sixers in a second. But no, I, I there's definitely not a big chance of that. Where does Steve keep going? I don't know. He keeps doing stuff. All right. Next up, uh, we have this uh, Robert Covington thing. He was uh, talking about Sixers fans. Uh, Sixers fans did boo him quite a bit. Mm-hmm. It was I thought a little unwarranted. I loved Robert Covington. I know Emily loved Robert Covington. Um, he has some stuff to say about the Sixers. I don't have it bookmarked. So Steve, why don't you take over now that you're back from your mysterious break? I'm back. Sorry, guys. I really had to take a few seconds. My computer's having a freak out fit. So what have you said? You said that, so how this started with Covington is that he commented on something on a Simmons thing and said, like, no wonder Simmons wanted out which I think is wrong, which I disagree with him about. And then he saw the reaction to that. And his initial tweet was, y'all kill me. I never said anything bad about Philly. Or he said like classic Philly in that Uh or something. Stop blowing what I said out of proportion. SMH, that's the problem with social media trying to find something out of nothing. That's Philly fans all day. Didn't I resign there? lol so of course i love the city booze and all so he went on in in some replies and and told some pretty you know upsetting stories about what people said to his family really terrible things horrible stuff that people said to his family over the years and um he also said that he's from chicago and he could handle the booze and he you know brett brown used to tell him that it comes with it with playing in the city that the harsh criticism comes with the love that he would get and you know, people were posting the videos of the right to Ricky Sanchez bus trip to Minnesota and, and the love that he got. And, you know, listen, he, I think that he's totally entitled to feel mixed feelings if, if those experiences were happening to his family. That's, you know, that's up to him. I think that he was off base in terms of what he said about Ben, just in terms of Ben's, ex, you know, what we know about the things that led to Ben's exit, which I think are kind of Ben's creation, frankly, you know, like the reasons that led up to Ben leaving. Um, but I love Covington and I, you know, I, I think that anybody saying that kind of shit to his family is like a piece of shit. <laughs> like, you know, if somebody said that to my family it would color the way I feel about that fan base for sure. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I would feel about it. And um, and I think it's a shame that he doesn't feel only great about his 
experience here, you know, like, cause we certainly, at least us, you know, I know that some fans have mixed feelings about him, but I certainly feel only great about his time here. Emily, how do you feel about this little back and forth of him? Yeah, um, very similarly. The things that he said, people said to his family were truly like disgusting and awful. And that like, I hate that like the small subset of Sixers fans who would say those things can color an entire fan base, but it definitely happens, especially like you said, if someone said that to like some one in my family had that experience, it would color it. Um, but I, th- I do think like by and large, he has a positive like recollection of his time here. Like he definitely got booed, but it's not like once he left the booing stop, like it's just kind of what we do. We boo our own players. Um, sometimes I think it's unwarranted. I'm more of an effort booer versus a missed shot booer, but that's just me. Um, but I wouldn't like, this just doesn't make me like be like, oh, Covington like doesn't get it. Like he hates Philly. I hate him. Like he is one of my favorite Philadelphia <laughs> athletes. I've loved him forever. Um, I'm pretty sure like my Venmo picture is still a picture of me and Robert Covington. And for a while I told Jordy that I wanted our save the days to just be a picture of me and Robert Covington. <laughs> and he thought about it for a little bit, but we decided to go in a different direction. Um but yeah, so it kind of makes me sad, but I think it's warranted, um, but not like his feelings are warranted, but not the in relation to Ben Simmons. I think they're two completely different situations and they don't really have a similarity, basically. Yeah, it's a shame for me. It's a shame that he saw like whatever fans booing or jeering Ben and his reaction is like that's Philly fans for you like that's a bummer but but to me it's not like you know I can't really tell him his experience you know like because he had a, some pretty firsthand visceral experiences and it, to me it's just like a fucking shame that uh that's how it went down on uh however many nights that was uh for for his family but you know I love him and I, I wish it, would, it, it had all gone down positively for him. Dan, wh- what do you think about all this? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't have like a ton of issue with it besides, you know, the part you guys pointed out where, you know, the, I don't have an issue with Covington said. I have issues with what was said to his family, um, obviously. Um, but like, you know, his, I, I think that, it, you know, it, it, how we feel about him is not how we feel about Ben Simmons. The, the, the booing is coming from a different place there. You know, it, it just really is. And, and I don't, you know, maybe it's that's Philly for you is, is a boo when Robert Covington has a bad shooting night. And I get that, you know, but that's Philly for you is not when the guy who refused to play for your team comes back and sits on the bench and does it to try to, you know, taunt the fans into helping him win a lawsuit. Like that's, (laughs) He, he would get that guy would get booed everywhere um so i just think it's kind of a, a silly comment to you know pretend that ben is some kind of victim here because he got booed in that situation um the only other thought besides everything you guys said is like why are we having players families sit among the fans like if if this is i don't know how often this is happening i don't know if this was like a one awful experience um or if this is like a pattern of people saying these things, but at a certain point, if it is a pattern, it's like, why don't we take out a box for everyone's family? Like, you know, that'll be the family box for the game. And like, maybe Josh Harris makes like a hundred less dollars that game. But like, it just seems like if, if that's possible, if that, if, if that's a pattern, then, then maybe it's time to like do something about that because that's like awful. Yeah, so e- even that though, the boxes are often within earshot from fans. So, and you know, to me, it's like the solution is for fans to behave humanely. You know, it's like, well, of course, but I'm saying a solution yeah. that is within within the means of like someone to actually say, "I did this to fix it," as opposed yeah, to yeah. like a short term you know, fix. A hundred yeah. jerks to all of a sudden like be bad. I agree. People. I agree. 
It um, is really and- interesting. Sorry. It is really interesting. Speaking of like family members in the crowd, like I, cause as I've said multiple times in this podcast, I spend half my time in the games, like looking for people on the sidelines and seeing who's around and whatever. And I like spotted like Callie Curry and she's just like chilling in like the low 100 sections, like not in a box, like with her and Seth's kids. And I'm just like, you're just sitting there in Brooklyn stuff. And like, luckily it was Seth Curry's family who was just here and had a good relationship. And I'm pretty sure. And her dad is the coach of the team. Like, I don't really think anyone's saying anything to her, but like just hanging out in the middle of all the people. Yeah. It's very wild to me. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I feel that all the time. I, I mean, I'm a celebrity, so like it's it's tough. I walk around. I, I don't. I try to keep a low profile. So I like I wear a lot of hats, so people won't recognize me when I try to get a coffee. And it's um because people want to come up and take a picture, but sometimes I just want to, you know, <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm with my family. Please don't bother. I'm with my family. No, thank you. It's it's not easy. Um. Okay. <laughs> The um, last thing is that there is a building narrative this week that nobody is talking about Nikola Jokic as the MVP. Now, if you're keeping score at home, he actually won the award last year. Abdul Nabi brought this up uh, today on the broadcast. Uh, Dan, you took this on as an issue this week. This is Dan's um, personal crusade this week. <laughs> no one is talking about him. Um, Zach Lowe, who I really like, talks about him on his podcast a lot. Uh, Bill Simmons is tweeting about this as if just fucking nobody, he's number one in the NBA's ladder. Nobody's talking about Nikola Jokic for MVP. It's, it's that no one talks about him at all. No one gives him attention. Nobody knows who he is, Dan. It's driving me crazy. It's driving me insane. <laughs> it's driving me insane. He won it last year. What more recognition do you want? I'm sorry people don't like him as much because he's a, like objectively less cool than Joel Embiid. <laughs> like, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, um, please like my MVP. But like, he's just not as cool or funny or fun. Um, but he's just not as cool. But um, he does uh, push but, people and give them whiplash for four months. Like. <laughs> everyone was okay glossing him he was out for four months <laughs> that was the funniest tweet it was like Mark and Morris will be back after a push from Nikola Jokic like what kind of push was this it's so crazy he, he was out for like half of a full pregnancy and nobody <laughs> cares no what one a cares. weird analogy that's a weird measuring stick <laughs> but, but <laughs> I'm telling you, if Joel Embiid did that, people would be oh, yeah. up. Well, arms. people would call him a dirty player. People would call him such a dirty player, and and Jokic swung at Devin Booker last year when they were eliminated. Like nobody gives a shit. But can I also say, this is how much less cool Jokic is than Embiid. That if Embiid had did that, like one, they would call him a dirty player, but the Philly fans would then rally behind him mm-hmm. and say that Joel had like a brother that then created this Twitter account to go after other people. Like we would, like we would have the brother on the podcast. Like we would be in support of the brother. Like we would just like embrace this and turn it into a thing. And Denver has just like, it's just like a gone thing. Like we're the ones bringing it up, not them. Like they don't know, even know how to pick up on the fun stuff. Like, they just don't. So, like, don't tell me that your guy is cool and fun when you don't even want to talk about the fun stuff. I can't help you there, then. Dan, any remarks? I mean, so the the reason this is brought up is because um, I believe his name is Rohan Nadkarni from Sports Illustrated. Let me make sure. Yes, that's his name. Um, Wrote a feature on Nikola Jokic. And... You know, it was, I mean, what a, what a get, the league MVP. That's a, that's a great get. You know, it was clear he put a lot of work into it, obviously. Um, got some great quotes. Uh, completely overshadowed all of the great work he put in by deciding to turn this piece, which was like, got some great quotes from the MVP. How cool was that? Into pushing this bizarre narrative that he put right in the headline 
I'm not sure he writes his own headlines, but it was put right in the headline that he is like the 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 under the underappreciated un, like no one knows this guy superstar like the the unknown superstar the guy who just won MVP and so you know I was one of the people a lot of people including his like national media colleagues were calling this out as kind of a ludicrous idea like this is just a ridiculous thing to say he then goes on to defend himself by citing like national TV games and like jersey sales of Jokic versus top players. And he's citing like RJ Barrett and like Joel Embiid and Kevin Durant's jersey sales. And it's like, or like LeBron James. And it's like, oh, LA, New York, and Philly. Yeah, they're big markets. Denver's not. Like Denver doesn't even televise its games locally to most of the people because there's like a disagreement between the channel that broadcasts the games and Comcast, which is by far the predominant um, like cable provider in Denver. And so most people can't even watch the Nuggets play in Denver. So yeah, he's a little bit less popular than the guys who play in major cities and have people who are able to watch their games. Like, yeah, he's not going to sell as many jerseys, but to say he's underappreciated when he's like half of like every stat nerd's favorite player and they won't stop talking about him. And they'll cite things like fantasy points per 75 possessions to say that Nikola Jokic should win MVP, then I think that what you're doing is just making stuff up and discrediting your own work. Like, he, here it is. So here's the, here's the headline if you're watching on YouTube. Oh Nikola God, Jokic gets, gets lost towards. among the stars, and he's okay with that. So the nice. reigning MVP doesn't receive the attention of other NBA leading men, but the Nuggets Center is quite satisfied with his status in the league. He, he, that's just not true. He, he won he MVP. Lower. He gets the attention. Like, I, it's such an insane narrative that we're going to start pushing. And it's so clearly like, a, you know, I want this guy to win MVP. I think he deserves MVP. And wouldn't it help his case if I just start gaslighting everyone into believing that, like, you actually don't even know who this guy is? Like, however good you think he is now, you actually don't even know who he is. That's how good he actually is. It's like, it's so ridiculous. He gets so lost out there among the stars. Shut the fuck up. How's that? How about you shut the fuck up? Jesus Christ. Gets lost among the stars. Jesus Christ. I've had enough. <laughs> this is horse shit. Who gives a shit? I don't want to buy his shitty jersey. Nobody watches his games. You know, this Comcast dispute wouldn't be a big deal if anybody gave a shit <laughs> probably it's but th the thing is like Jokic is phenomenal like if Jokic won MVP this year I wouldn't think it's like the craziest thing although he's not my pick and and I think the MB should be the leader right now like there's time left whatever I think the people who use advanced stats to say that like Nicole Jokic is having the greatest season ever are like out of their minds you know like he's the sixth seed I don't his team is bad it's not that bad um he they're, they're they'd be awful without him but like it's not like unthinkable he's led this team to the 60 like they have some okay players <laughs> it, he's he's really 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 good he's a future hall of fame he might end his career as a top 10 center ever but he's not better than prime michael jordan so like it, 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 i don't know what we're doing but it, it's gotten so ridiculous and the talk around him has gotten so ridiculous from certain people i, I just can't i can't take it i can't take it Joel's got to play in this game. He has to play. He has to play. <sighs> All right. Let's get a standings update here from our very own Emily Cannell. Okay. So we all said they're going to win all the games last week. And they won two of them. And they lost one of them. So Steve is still in the lead at 42 and 25. And then me at 41 and 26. And then Dan at 38 and 29. That's where we are at. A little behind the gastro, I said off mic to Dan and Drew, Emily, you were not here. You were bowling or hustling and bustling over here that I will not be with you next week. I will be at a um, wedding next Sunday. So you and Dan will be left alone to your own devices next weekend, next Sunday. The after the. Alone. After the game. 
Um, this week, a tough week of games. The Sixers play Denver at home on Monday. Then they play at Cleveland, then home against Dallas, and then Toronto on Sunday night. Four games. Uh, each of them are, are tough games. These are not, this is a really tough week. Denver at Cleveland, and then home against Dallas and Toronto. Um, four good teams. Denver at Cleveland, Dallas and Toronto. Emily, you're up first. All right. They're going to win the Denver game. Uh, they're going to beat Cleveland. They're going to beat Dallas. They're going to lose to Toronto. That's yeah. what I've got for you. I'm going to say they beat Denver because I'm going. So I have to go to that. Those are the rules. They beat Cleveland. They lose to Dallas and they lose to Toronto. I'm going two and two. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. They beat Denver. They're going to beat Denver 121 to 71. If, if that's not the final score, you count that as a loss. No, we don't agree. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the exact score. Um, they beat Cleveland, certainly. <sighs> Dallas is very good. They've been playing great. But bad news, Dallas, they beat Dallas. And they're going to... Hmm. They're going to beat Toronto as well. Four wins. Wow. <sighs> Four wins. There it All is. right. That's it for us. Watch us on YouTube, uh, Dasher Blues Podcast, the Sixers Podcast. Follow us everywhere. DA Pelts 13, Gastro Blues Pod, Third and Girls, DJ Lippman. Uh, write as Rainy on Instagram. <laughs> and uh, and uh, follow us everywhere. And uh, let's just all, Kyrie, go out there and get the vaccine. Or don't, whatever you want to do. Um, no, get it. Um, yeah, that's it. Good stuff. And uh, I'll miss you guys next week. Bye, and be safe and be great. Be safe and be great.